Okay. Uh, where is Martin? Come here. Where, where am I? Oh, yeah, it was man in black over there. Okay. Well, folks, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce our next uh, keynote industry uh, keynote speaker. Um, and the, uh, the session is going to be led by Martin Kearns. I've had the great pleasure of working in an organisation together with Martin a few years ago. I regard Martin as uh, one of the most innovative uh, people I have worked with. You're going to hear some fabulous stuff and Martin's also a great mate. So uh, welcome, Martin, Thanks, and Martin. take it away, Cheers. mate. Cheers. Guys. So I'm just going to invite um, some of my team onto the floor. I know you've eaten and you're all a little bit tired, so um, we wanted to play out a scenario that you might have seen in the past, and it kind of goes like this. I'm going to try and pass the ball. All right, Dave? Dave, ready? OK, so that's it. I want to go talk through that. Thank you. Come on. I I'm an Irishman who knows how to pass a footy. I reckon that's a bit respectful. <laughs> so um, what just happened? Well, poor F Dave there, he didn't get the ball. He's feeling a bit sorry for himself. He feels that I even called his name and I didn't give him the ball. Someone else went, well, that ball's now mine. And as a result, I'm regretting passing the ball to Pete. So what happens when we have these scenarios play out on kids' footy fields. We talk about working together as a team. We talk about you actually detracted the defender. You did a good job. We're always trying to give in those messages of support that this was, the, this was a good scenario because we maintained possession. We know these conversations. We've, some of you probably even say those conversations on a Saturday on a footy field and for some of you like me on a Sunday with the kids' football, which is somewhat painful. So if we know this and if we're willing to teach our kids, why do we let this happen? Why is it when we talk about funding, Pete becomes like Gollum and we talk about, my precious, it's my budget, <laughs> right? You never want to give that away. You want to support the team that day, do you? So what was I thinking about giving the budget to you? Oh shit, what's going to happen next year? So why is it that we aren't willing to be team players in organisations, although we will ask our kids to do it on a football field. And even worse than all of that is when we then look at the PMO and we think they're the defenders. They're the defence that we're trying to avoid. And if it wasn't the PMO, it's another process that we're trying to avoid. You know, if we're wanting to become digital leaders, which is I assume why you're here, we have to revisit our role so that we're not acting in a defensive role, that we're being consultative. There is so much change that is required for organizations to leverage the technology of today, never mind about the future. The technology as it exists today, we are not leveraging. It's as simple as that, and why not? It's because we have mindsets in organizations that make no sense on a playing field for kids, but we're willing to replay them every day in our organizations. Why is that? Why do we allow habit dictate us to that level? Now, here's one of the reasons is because the organizations need to do something, but it needs to build the capacity to do it. One of the things that is going to stop you is the conversation that you have with, oh, my calendar's so full today, I'm so busy. I haven't got any time for transformational change. I have no time to think about how the future needs to go, because I'm too busy doing all the things I need to do. That you're not willing to delegate, that you shouldn't be doing in the first place. I've got data from an organization that said that the reason why all teams are frustrated with the likes of you was because that you were too involved in operational decisions. And why do we do that? Well, it's because what we know is probably what we got was promoted. I have asked leaders many times, how much time do you give to change? It's like a half hour on a Friday before I go home. So is that, is that the priority? So we ask ourselves, why aren't we changing fast enough when you can't delegate, when you can't relinquish control of your, your calendar? So it actually requires a degree of discipline with you. So yes, we have great technology out there, but it won't be leveraged if unless you improve your discipline. And BAU should not be your norm. The future is where you should be focusing on. It should be where you should be prioritizing. And we have to ask ourselves, why not? And what are we going to do differently? Because I'm not here just to shame you, I'm here to try and inspire you. 
Like, I'll give you an example. Gartner have spoken that by 2030, 70% of product development has to shift to, to a product-centric approach over a project approach. They have given us seven key leading indicators of why that's a smart move. However, executive management will be uncomfortable and they'll be combative against these benefits. Why is that? Why would we not want this? It makes perfect sense. Well, one of the reasons why is because we are not accepting complexity. We do not accept that complexity is in our workplace. One thing about complexity that as a leader you should embrace is that when you are working in a complex environment, you are now consciously incompetent. Because when a problem is complex, you don't know. I'm pretty sure that none of you have ever spent time trying to write an AI algorithm. I don't believe any of you have ever done anything with machine learning, but you know what? You need it in your organizations going forward. But you've never done it. It's not in your experience. Where is it going to come from? It's not from you. Are you willing to say you don't know? Are you willing to learn? Are you also willing to change? One of the things that we have to be very careful of is that our experiences have developed our ego. And that is a filter that, not might help, may, that may not help you in the future of, of where we're going. Another thing is that when we focus on what we know, the questions we ask are the questions we are comfortable with. They're not the right questions to be asking. We try to narrow to solutions far too soon when we should be actually looking at the complexity of the workplace. The interdependencies of your workplaces going forward are far more important. Data will not generate value unless it connects to other forms of data to generate insight. And that insight will not be predictive, it will be exploratory and emergent. It will be derived through experience and experiment that you will not be part of what you will need to listen to and make decisions from. Where do you create the space to make that form of listening and part of your life? Well, if you're too busy, it won't happen. If we cannot help our leadership to evolve its consciousness and appreciate the levels of complexity in the workplace, well, the future is going to be a long way away. In fact, other people will probably pass you out. So what, here's two of the traps that are holding you back. The first one is using defensive reasoning as part of the conversations that you're having. The problems that we're trying to solve in the digital era are disruptive. We say the word digital rather than just IT for a reason. We're trying to disrupt the norm. We're trying to disrupt the past. We needed a new word. We created a new word. We wanted to call it disruptive, but we were told it won't get into conferences very well when you said, I want to disrupt. So we said, oh, let's call it digital. Oh, that's better. And what we have to understand is that the reactions that people are having as a result of that is it's actually going to change how they work and what they do. Service now just explained that to you, and we have to appreciate that that is a form of stress. But it's also a form of stress on you, that the way that you have worked in the past is not in your future, and where are you managing that stress? Who is helping you to go through that? Are any of you seeking coaching? The other element is the direction. We're, we're still trying to make everything a black and white conversation. And in fact, all you're doing now is working within the gray. I'll give you an example that I've been contemplating on. Why is it that organizations in the government departments are still looking to define a problem, to set a requirement, to go out to tender, to read the proposals, to choose a vendor when you're pretty much incompetent on the problem and it's poorly defined in the first place? Why would you follow that approach in complexity? Why do we try to do that? Well, there's a reason why. It's because we're not willing to ask different questions. We crave the simple story. We want history to repeat itself. We want their experience to be valued. We want it to be fast. We want it to be low maintenance. So we go with what we know. But what you know is not part of how your future is going to help uh, be, def uh, be created. With any form of complexity, the simple story is usually wrong. That is where you've simplified the problem to suit your mindset rather than moving to the problem and being uncomfortable with that. We allow ourselves to be leaded into false sense of securities around poor choices. 
You know, if we're going to choose a, a classic, my favourite right now is I hear government departments say, well, we're going to uh, go with a software as a service and we're not going to do any form of customization. From now on, it's configuration all the way, people. Right? So what you're going to do is you're going to work with the lowest common denominator set of features that an enterprise has defined to suit all problems, and you're going to sacrifice how you differentiate and how you add value to the norm. Well, that's what you'd need to do if you want to just configure. So we say these things, and we, we, and we believe in them, but the consequences I don't think we really appreciate. One of the other habits that we've fallen into is you know, um, trying to break problems up. A an old way of looking at things was by defining the separation of interests. What are you interested in and what are you interested in? This is what you're good at, I want you to do it, and when you're finished, I want you to pass it on to you, and you're going to have to make sure that what you get is what you need, because I'll be holding you accountable from this point onwards. Right. How much waste has that created? How many documents have you written that nobody has read? Look at your SharePoint. Look at all of those folders. The best one, if you want to have a look at it, look at the folder for PIRs. And see how many of those documents have been opened and read and learned from. So we have to be understanding that if we're going to try and be different, we have to disrupt. We have to disrupt the way that we work. Hierarchy is helpful. It helps stability. It helps us to create stable organizations, especially to help manage a workforce from a HR perspective. But that's not going to help you solve some of the problems you need to do today. We actually need cross-functional teams that have no respect for hierarchy, that are going to fix the problem in the way the problem needs to be solved. We're not going to say, well, the problem that we need to solve on a particular program or project or product, hopefully, is not going to be constrained by the habits of the past. We're willing to challenge them. We want them to change. So here's one way that you can change. One way you can change is by creating space for strategic thinking, shifting away from just project mindsets and having a portfolio view, a portfolio conversation where all are welcome. This is the Department of Transport. They have a, a meeting on a Tuesday and a Thursday, and on that, they talk about their work. Anybody can attend. What you'll see, that's in a public area. And anybody means anybody, including the CEO. The director is in the center, and we have an architect, God bless him, presenting on an argument that a project needs to start and has to be passing priorities of others and the priority owners are all listening. Probably the ones with their arms crossed are the ones who aren't very interested in what's happening right now. But what we have is we have a medium where we're, it's okay to have this conversation. We're seeing body language. We don't shame people at that point in time saying, stop crossing your arms. We understand that there's conversations that have to be had afterwards because they're not psychologically safe to be had now, but we can see those indicators. We also have a conversation where BAU is banned. You can't talk about what you're working on. It's a conversation around prioritization, and it's everybody, in everybody's interest. One of the things that we have done in the Agile community is we shifted a question where we said, what are you working on today? And we thought, oh, that was a really bad question, because we've heard all sorts of bullshit. We've changed it to what are you working on today in, related, in relationship to the shared goal. Sometimes we hear nothing. So if we create areas where we focus on particular questions and use them as a cognitive filter, true transparency will be achieved. And I'm asking you to start thinking about that. Here's one way of doing it. Here's a bit of fun. Go back to your offices and get one of the nice big meeting rooms everybody likes and ban every meeting from that that is non-strategic and supporting the transformational change of our organization. Every other meeting is not allowed, and let's see what happens. Let's see who uses that meeting, and if you want to be brave, allow that meeting room, whoever is having a conversation in it, that anybody can sit in and listen, no matter who is in the room. 
make it open invitation. We like transparency, well go and create it and see how many people feel safe to enter into that room because they're interested in the conversation. We, if we don't create these types of new practices, how are we going to disrupt the future and how can we test our appetite for it as well? One of the other things that happens in that conversation is we break down two really bad habits. One habit is that everything that gets started should finish. All scope must be completed. Whoever said that was a great idea? I can't think of anything worse. And also, even better, is that failed projects should be celebrated. One of the stories that we've had to do is when a project is killed, stone dead, never to resurrect again under a new project name, everybody must applaud. It's a celebration. It's a celebration because their portfolio has relief funding that other people can allocate. 23 failed projects that have failed in the initiation was a success because it led to new learnings and new opportunities to be leveraged rather than the bullshit projects to keep going because they were on the original plan. But the thing was, we had to create a forced celebration. That wasn't natural, people, but it is becoming. So sometimes we have to fake it till we make it. The first false applaud has generated into something that we recognize as valuable, probably because you got the money you were looking for. One of the other things that we have to be careful of is trying to always feel right. Because when we try to feel right, we're always looking at our, our successes of the past. We're trying to act confident based on what we know, rather than probably sometimes addressing the uncertainty in the room and feeling less confident. One of the ways to deal with that is to make sure that we can create different forms of constraint. Not waiting to have everybody sign off consensus, is capping spend and looking for forced feedback loops even when people don't really want to have one. That's the time to, to solve things because that's when you have the chance to solve. Think about it this way. If I fail a project and it's 3 to 5% of its budget, isn't there a better chance that's going to happen than 30 or 40% of its budget? If that was the case, then why would you spend so much money writing a business case? And why do you spend so much money trying to get that design signed off before we can begin? And why do we spend so much time trying to define up front to a single solution? You see, that's when you can't fail, because you've spent so much money. So start thinking about the constraints that help for feedback to occur. It requires different forms of learning. I'm not here to teach all of this to you. I just want you to focus on the one at the bottom. You need to unlearn. There's things that have helped you to be successful that you're now needing to unlearn in your future. Where do you create the capacity to unlearn? Do you truly believe you have to? Have you got the humility to accept not knowing? My biggest problem in government is always trying to seek consensus. And in fact, cynics are seen as negative or people who are just trying to block us. What we have to understand in complex problems, contra contradictory pos uh, positions is key. It builds diversity of knowledge, which makes us socially smarter. And rather than trying to make the decision, why don't we create three opportunities to try and compare and contrast to find the right answer, rather than trying to assume it? Why do we have to pick one vendor up front? Why can't we have five deliver the same thing? And maybe not, it's not, like we're not playing like X Factor here. I think we watch too much reality shows. We don't necessarily always have to have one winner. Why can't it be a cooperative effect? Maybe it's the combination of two vendors that's going to solve your problem rather than constraining yourself to one. Where do we allow ourselves to have those types of options? Well, what's going to happen is that if we constrain the conversations to the data points that we're used to, it means that people will withhold information that they know is vital to the decision. So think about your favorite spreadsheet or your favorite PowerPoint template and ask yourself how much conversation has that killed? How much of diversity of knowledge has been lost by trying to force and suit a particular framework? Allow for contradictions, allow for your devil's advocate to be valued. One of the things that I'd like to leave you with is another practice that we created, was the practice of learning. 
depending on how much you need to learn, the cadence will be different. Here are some of the questions that we introduced into the learning practice. What have I learned since I last saw you? What do I need in order to achieve a shared goal? What have I noticed before that I think we need to remember? They're really good questions. How often do you create the space to ask them? How often have you asked them? I'm saying to support the digital era, you really need to try and start moving to those type of questions being a priority. I'd like to share this final picture. This is my favorite team, Celtic. They created the huddle, they were the first. And when they do that huddle, when I'm standing in the crowd, I feel part of it. So should your customers. In order to achieve the success, success of the future, it's a team sport, it's a team game, and everybody can be a winner. And I embrace all of you joining me on that journey. Thank you for your time.